Good evening. Good evening. So, on August 20th of this year, we reached Earth Overshoot Day. In essence, that is the day that our resource consumption for the year exceeded Earth's ability to replenish itself. And every day, that day falls earlier and earlier in our calendar year. This image shows our resource consumption over time, depicted by the footprint. And what we can see is the first globe is actually 1960, the second one is the 80s, and the third globe de depicts our resource consumption in 2013. And what we can see is that we're using up one and a half times Earth's resources. We are, in essence, in ecological debt. My personal journey that brought me to this point of awareness comes, as all stories do, from a sense of conflict. Mine was a crisis around my national identity. By the time I'd reached my late teens, I'd lived in Canada, Somalia, Zambia, Barbados. I'd schooled at an international school in Italy, speaking Italian in the playground with African and Turkish kids. And yet, I'm a British-born national of Indian heritage, but eight years of boarding school in England did nothing to quell this crisis and this sense of loss around my national identity. So in my 20s, I took off to India. I was a motorbike tour guide, and I traveled the landscape of my heritage, exploring the land of my forefathers through my lenses of how I'd been formed. And what I recognized in that journey is that my sense of belonging was without national borders. And in essence, I was a global citizen and a part of this pulsing ecosystem that we all live within. So I came back to Barbados, and I set up a map-making business, creating tourist maps for visitors to the, the Leeward and the Windward Islands. And for two decades, I traveled up and down, documenting indigenous sites, places of cultural importance, and showcasing local businesses. And I developed a great respect and affinity for West Indian cultures and the connection with Earth systems and the oceans and the land and this sense of belonging in this cultural, social tradition. But what I noticed in those decades is there was a rapid depletion of our environment as we were making this initial progress into rapid development. And I saw community structure start to break down. So I took back to the road. And this time I went into Asia to understand this issue about development and progress. How do we define it? How do we measure well-being of societies? And I thought I might find some connections in Asia with the spiritual association. I went into Australia. I visited the Thai islands, the Greek islands. I went into the Himalayas to work with rural development agencies. I went to university. I went to South America. All of this exploring this concept of development and how we measure it. And what I discovered is that pretty much unanimously all over the world, we are using a measure of economic progress to define our development. So we, we're measuring it according to an indicator known as GDP, which is essentially gross domestic product. It's the sum total, total value of everything we produce, all of the goods and the services. And whilst that's an acceptable measure on its own, what it fails to account for is the externalities of that development. And I want to give you an example of a, a social externality. Um, let's say my house is broken into and I am obliged to buy a new lock for my front door. And perhaps I have to contract the services of a locksmith to come and, and install the new lock. And I may even go so far as to install an alarm system to protect my family and myself. All of those three activities go into our GDP and are seen as contributing to our progress and development as a society. But in actual fact, my social well-being, that of my community and my family, has been impacted negatively. I want to pull this into an environmental example as well. In the pursuit of development, we, we may consider developing what was formerly a mangrove into either a hotel plant or a marina. 
We may consider that that, ma that mangrove offers us no economic value, and the economic benefits of that marina are more. And certainly they are in terms of construction, jobs, service jobs, foreign exchange earnings. But that mangrove is the nursery and the building block for our fish that, live, that go to the reef, and in turn, our food supply. That mangrove is the building block that supports our marine ecosystem. That mangrove is a, a, a measure against storm, stormwater resiliency. That mangrove has economic value against sea level rise. Coupled with this, we have a phenomenon that is known as shifting baselines. It's a, it's a long, slow, hard change that leads to some kind of collective amnesia. And to illustrate this point, I want to show you three images that are taken over a series of time. The first one is from 1957. And it's in waters not dissimilar to ours. It's in Key West, Florida. It's at the end of the fishing tournament, and they've brought in the catch. And we can see that the catch size is pretty much over a meter. And the, this type of fish that were caught were predominantly groupers, top of, the, top of the marine ecosystem. In 1980, we can see that the size of the fish catch has diminished, diminished a little bit. But what's really alarming is fast forward to 2007, from that same pier, the size of the fish has decreased by almost 50%. And not only has the size of the fish decreased, but the type of fish that were found has changed. There's one grouper in that image. The rest are snappers. The predators have gone from our marine system. I want to bring this a little bit closer to home. This is the Barbados coat of arms that was adopted in 1966. A lot of those images are still familiar to us, but the one on the right, the brown pelican, he hasn't seen our shores for a while. So the IUCN has recently compiled a report um, that has made an assessment of the level of extinction of all of our nature's ecosystems. And of the tw there's over 300,000 of species that we know, doc uh, of species of plants that we know have been documented but they actually assessed only 12,900, and what they found was 68% of these 12,914 plants were at risk of extinction. 30% of our amphibians are at risk of extinction, and 21% of our fish. On the list of threatened species, 50% of our mammals are threatened, and 30% of our corals. So it's a fairly bleak picture we've got in front of us. And clearly, there's an urgent need and a call to action. I'm happy to say this is my part of good news here. Um, there are some incredible people all over the world that are working towards addressing these urgent changes that we need to embrace. And one of these, I believe, at a national level, if we want to define our progress as a society and a community, we must move away from defining our wealth in terms of economic value alone. And we must look at society's well-being and incorporate indicators in our national planning and our policy development process that allow us to measure how our, society, how our society is doing and measure the value of our environment that supports us. Ultimately, however, there are more people in the world than there are national governments, or there are businesses. And so really, with small individual change that looks as our, at our individual resource consumption, we have the power to affect enormous change. And so as we redefine wealth today, I urge you to consider what is the value that you would place on a leaf that supplies that oxygen which is vital to your breath. Thank you.